Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be moving into section 2.2 from your textbook, which introduces us into matrix operations and matrix algebra. In the previous video, uh, we took some time to sort of give some basic definitions and some notation for matrices. Uh, talked a little bit about what a matrix really represents, how it's a collection of sort of objects uh, written in sort of a row column format. Talked about some of the terminology that we'll be using for matrices. Just sort of gave a general introduction into the, this new uh, sort of mathematical object. In this video, we're going to be taking some time to learn how to perform different operations on matrices, the standard sort of arithmetic operations that you might expect, things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and not only studying sort of how to define those and what those uh, operations look like, but also some of the properties, because even though they might have names similar to operations you guys are used to, like addition, multiplication, subtraction, that because this is a new mathematical object, we actually have to go through and confirm that these operations will have the same properties that we're used to. So let's jump right in and start with the most basic one, which is defining matrix addition. So for matrix addition, we're going to let A and B be two matrices of the same size. So for matrix addition to make sense, you have to have matrices of the same size, M by N. And then the matrix A plus B will also be an M by N matrix, and we will define it element by element, where the ijth element of A plus B is the ijth element of A plus the ijth element of B. So you can sort of think about that this statement here says that when you add matrices, you add them element by element. So you just combine the element in each position, in the same position in matrix A as the same position in matrix B, put those together, and that gives you the element in that same position in the sum of those two matrices. Only thing that's a little bit uh, sort of different here is just to make sure that not all matrix additions are going to be well-defined. You have to have two matrices that have the same size. In terms of properties of matrix addition, uh, matrix addition acts just like normal addition in the sense that it is commutative. So A plus B is the same as B plus A. So it does not matter the order in which you do matrix addition. And it is associative, meaning that if you have A plus B plus C, you can choose to do the B plus C first and then add the A to that. Or you could add the A and B together and then add the C. Remember that what it really means to be associative is that the need for parentheses is, is not actually true. You don't actually need parentheses. You could just write A plus B plus C because it doesn't matter if you add the first two together or the last two together first. It's associative. So um, we're not going to prove these properties. Uh, it's pretty easy um, to prove these based on this element definition. We will be doing some proofs of properties a little bit later using the element definition of matrix operations. So we'll get a chance to prove things similar to this. If you want, you can always, after sort of completing this video, come back and actually try to directly prove these statements. For now, though, uh, we'll move on to our next operation, which is scalar multiplication. So for scalar multiplication, you're going to have A be an M by N matrix and K be a scalar value. Scalar value just means it's not a matrix or anything. It's just a value. It could be a real number. It could be a complex number. Later on, when we sort of revisit what we're discussing here for matrix functions, the scalar might be a scalar function. But the main thing is it's not a matrix. It's just a single scalar value. Then the matrix Ka is also going to be an M by N matrix, so same size as the original, and you're going to define the elements by component-wise multiplication, meaning that the ijth element of Ka is K times the ijth element of the original matrix A. So in other words, when you do a scalar multiplication, you just simply distribute that scalar onto every element of the matrix. What are the properties of scalar multiplication? Well, it has the unit property, as we would hope. If you do the scalar 1 times the matrix A, you will get the same matrix A back. It has the distributive property over matrix addition. So if you have a scalar K times the matrix addition of A plus B, then that's the same as KA plus KB. So you have that distributive property that we're used to. And it is associative, meaning if you have two different scalars, K1 and K2, you can choose to do K2 times A first, and then multiply by K1, or you could multiply the scalars together, K1 times K2, and then take the result and multiply that on to A. So in other words, scalar multiplication acts just as you would expect. So far, all the operations we've defined have exactly the same properties that they would have had when we were just learning about them in basic arithmetic. All right, now that we have a uh, matrix addition and scalar multiplication, we can actually use those two together to define matrix subtraction. So let's go ahead and talk about that. 
Um, technically, we could skip writing out matrix subtraction. We could just simply say A minus B is defined as A plus the scalar negative 1 times B. That's a way of basically, if we are trying to be as concise as possible, we could simply say there is no such thing as matrix subtraction. Matrix subtraction is just simply addition with a negative 1 scalar attached to the second matrix. However, um, we can also write it out more uh, sort of fully. We can say that what this definition really means is that if you have two matrices, A and B, that are the same size, so matrix subtraction, just like matrix addition, must have the same size. Then the matrix A minus B will be also an M by N matrix where the elements are defined by component-wise or element-wise subtraction. So the ijth element of A minus B is the ijth element of A minus the ijth element of B. Okay, so matrix subtraction, just as you would expect there. Uh, it's probably a good idea, idea, as we're sort of talking about these, we're going to talk about some very uh, special matrices uh, that as we're sort of introducing different operations that have sort of a relation here. So as we know, when you're adding and subtracting, zero is a very special number. When you're adding and subtracting, adding by zero doesn't change anything. Subtracting by zero doesn't change anything. You subtract something by itself, you're going to get zero. So there's an equivalent for that in terms of matrices, and it's what's called the zero matrix. So the zero matrix of size M by N is simply a matrix entirely of zeros. Um, in terms of notation, if you see zero sub M times N, that means the zero matrix of size M by N. That should make sense. If you see only a single subscript, zero sub N, that means the square matrix of size N by N. So oftentimes we skip writing N by N because when we just write a single subscript, that means the square matrix. What are the properties of the zero matrix? Well, if we let A be an M by N matrix, then as you would expect, A plus the zero matrix is equivalent to A, so it acts just like zero, adding by zero doesn't change anything. If you take a matrix A and subtract it by itself, you get the zero matrix of the appropriate size. And if you do zero times A, you get the zero matrix. Now, this is a great moment to just talk about sort of notation here. Notice that because this zero here has no subscript or anything, that zero is the scalar zero. So we're saying if you do scalar multiplication by zero onto a matrix A, you will result in the zero matrix, right? So since there was no subscript on that zero, that didn't mean a zero matrix. That meant just the single scalar zero. Okay, now that we've talked about matrix addition, scalar multiplication, and matrix subtraction, let's take a look at a quick example here. So for this example, we're going to define three matrices here. So matrix A, matrix B, and matrix C. Uh, and what we try to do is we want to evaluate the following if possible. And of course, there is that sort of comment there, if possible, because we know if the sizes don't sort of align, we might not be able to do these operations. So before we get into this, let's just do a quick reminder of some of the stuff we talked about, like size and things like that. You should be able to see that A is a two by three matrix. It's two rows, three columns. B is a three by three square matrix. And C is also a two by three matrix. So let's go ahead and jump into just evaluating these. So A plus C, uh, well, uh, is that going to be an allowed operation? This is 2 by 3, this is 2 by 3, so we can just add them together. How do we do that addition? Well, we just add them component-wise. So we would add the 2 and the 1, so that gives us 3. And then we would add the 3 and the 4, so that would give us 7. And then we should get 8, and then it looks like 0 and 5 and 3. Okay, so there we go. So adding them, you just simply add element by element. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So let's see if we can do A plus B. So A plus B, we're trying to add matrix A to matrix B. You will notice though that matrix A and matrix B are different sizes. So unfortunately, this one here is not defined. So we are unable to add A plus B because the sizes don't match. So it's just a not defined operation. All right, for C, we want to look at 3B. So we want to do scalar multiplication of matrix B by the scalar 3. Interestingly, if you look back at B, you might notice uh, that not only is it a 3 by 3 square matrix, um, you might also notice that B is also a symmetric matrix. It's symmetric because if you were due to transpose of B, uh, this and this would swap, but nothing would change. This and this would swap. This and this would swap, and it would actually be the same. So interestingly, B is a symmetric matrix. Let's see what happens if we multiply it by a scalar of 3. It's an interesting question about whether or not it will remain symmetric. 
So 3b would just simply be scalar multiplication onto each element. So uh, 3 times that 2 is going to give us 6, and then 9, and then 15, and then 9, and 0, and negative 3, and then 15, and negative 3, and 18. And uh, you might not be surprised to sort of see that this, even though it is a definitely a different matrix, this is also symmetric. And actually, we'll talk a little bit uh, about that later on. Um, we can actually prove that in general, if you start with a symmetric matrix, then multiplying it by a scalar value, it's going to remain a symmetric matrix. And you can think about how you might try to prove that. Okay, well, let's go ahead and look at D. So for D, we want to do negative 5A transpose. Now, we could go ahead and try to just do this all at once, but let's remind ourselves first what the transpose looks like. So let's take A transpose, which remember is going to take each of these rows and turn them into columns. So this is going to be negative 5 times now 2, 3, 0, and negative 1, 2, 5. So notice that the A transpose is now a 3 by 2 matrix, as we know, because what does transpose do? It interchanges rows and columns. And then that scalar multiplication by negative 5 there is going to give us negative 10, 5, negative 15, negative 10, 0, and negative 25. So there's the matrix that is equivalent to negative 5 A transpose. All right, last one. Let's go ahead and see if we can do 4 C minus 2a. So is this going to be well defined? Well, we can sort of look ahead, right? 4c is still going to be 2 by 3, and 2a is still going to be 2 by 3. So scalar multiplication never changes the size. So since they're still going to be 2 by 3s, doing the subtraction should be fine there. So let's write out what 4c is going to look like. So we'll scale and multiply by 4. So 4, 16, 32, 4, 12, and negative 8, it looks like. And then we're going to subtract uh, 2a. So that's 4, 6, and 0, uh, negative 2, 4, and 10. So there we go. Uh, there's our sort of uh, our 4a minus, or our, sorry, our 4c minus our 2a. And now we can just subtract. And to do that subtraction, we just subtract component wise. So it looks like we'll get 0, and then 10, and then 32, and then 6, and 8, and a negative 8 minus 10. Looks like negative 18. So there we go. There is our 2 by 3 matrix that is equivalent to 4C minus 2A. So there's just some basic examples, adding, subtracting, scalar multiplication, transpose. Um, did main thing to just take away here, right? Just because you write A plus B or A plus C or something, uh, you, you're not guaranteed that you're writing a well-defined operation. And in this case, that A plus B was not defined because the sizes were different. Okay. So far, everything with matrix operations should seem pretty straightforward. Everything pretty much mimics what we would expect. So far, matrix addition, scalar multiplication, matrix subtraction, everything is just done element by element. Now we're going to talk about the first operation that sort of acts a little bit differently, and that is going to be matrix multiplication. So let's talk about the definition for matrix multiplication here. So matrix multiplication has a sort of different uh, size restriction. What this one says is that A needs to be an M by N matrix, and B needs to be an N by P matrix. The key thing here is that the number of columns of the first matrix has to match the number of rows of the second one. So you'll notice that the N and N, those are the things that have to correspond. Then the matrix product A times B will be an M by P matrix, so it'll have M rows and P columns. So they have to have a matching sort of N, but the overall resulting size will be M, P. And the way we actually define this is we define that the ijth element of this product is going to be the sum from K equals 1 to N. Notice that that N is going to be shared by the A and B matrix. That's why it has to correspond here. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to take A, I, K times B, K, J. Now, this is a pretty complicated sort of formula, so I want to make a couple quick comments on this before we look at some examples. First of all, what are these components doing? Well, if you look at it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to determine the ijth element of the product. So what you do is you take yourself and you put yourself in the ith row of A. So this component here, this AIK, let's make sure I circle it there, there, this, since you're always keeping the I constant and then you're letting k run from 1 to n 
This runs through ith row of a. And then what this does, this bkj, well, the j will stay constant based on the, the, trying to get the ijth element. So the j will stay constant, which means that this is running through the jth column of b. So this is actually going through and runs through jth column of b. So in other words, what you're basically doing is you're taking the ith row of a times the jth column of b, and that gives you the ijth element of the product. This also should tell you, and if you look in your textbook, they give a sort of very thorough step-by-step -step derivation of where this comes from. What the general idea from that is, which I think it's an interesting derivation, but it's, it's not quite necessary for our class. So I'll just make it as a common here. It's really an extension of the dot product. So if you remember from when you took like a basic like sort of geometry course or in like your multivariate calculus course, you learned about the dot product, which was a way of taking the product of two vectors. And matrix multiplication basically extends that concept. And what you do is you basically take the dot product of each row of the first matrix with each column of the second matrix, and that gives you each individual element of your resulting product. So for this matrix multiplication, we're going to do a couple examples. Uh, main thing to sort of keep in mind is that the size restriction is that the number of columns for the first matrix has to match the number of rows for the second one. So let's go ahead and actually try using this formula to determine some of these here. So we've got our example here. We're going to define these matrices here. And what we'd like to do is try to evaluate the following if possible. So let's make a little note about the sizes of these things. The first matrix is a three by two, three rows, two columns. Uh, matrix B is a two by four matrix, two rows, four columns. Then C is a two by two square matrix, and D is a two by two square matrix. So let's uh, take a look at A here. So A is we're trying to multiply A and B. So is A, B going to be well-defined? Well, we're going to be doing a three by two times a two by four. So since that two by two and that sorry that three by two and that two by four they share this two there number of columns here matches the number of rows here this computation is going to make sense so we are going to be able to do this so I'll just make a note here three by two and two by four so this is going to work so what we're going to do according to this expression here is we're going to take a row of A and multiply it with a column of B. And you'll notice, because of the fact that those, that 2 corresponds, that there's two things here to multiply with two things here. If those didn't correspond, then that multiplication wouldn't make sense. So to start to do this, right, we'll give ourselves a sort of a matrix to start with. We're going to be taking this row times this column. So we do 5 times 6, that's going to give us 30. And then 4 times 2, that's going to give us 8. And then we sum those up. That's what this formula is saying. So 5 times 6, 30, 4 times 2, 8, add those together, we get 38. So that gives us our 1, 1 position. Now we can take this row times this column. So that's going to be negative 5 and 0, add those together, we get negative 5. Then we take this row times this column, that's going to give us a 5 and an 8. 5 and 8 is going to give us 13. Then five and that row in this column, that's gonna give us a 15 and a 16. 15 and 16 is gonna give us 31. So that's gonna be our first row of our product because we always were using the first row of A with each of the columns of B. And that gave us the first row of the product. Now we're gonna take the second row of A times the first column here. That's gonna be a 36 and a 16. 36 and 16 is gonna be 52. Then this row times this column, that's gonna be a negative six and a zero. So that's gonna be negative six. Then this row times this column, that's gonna be six and 16, which is gonna be 22. And then six, eight and three, four, that's gonna be in 18 and a 32. 18 and 32 is gonna be 50. Then finally, we're on our last row here. So negative 1, 2, and 6, 2. That's going to be negative 6 and 4. So negative 6 plus 4 is going to be negative 2. Then negative 1, 2, and negative 1, 0. It's going to be 1 and 0. So 1. And then negative 1 and 2 and 1, 2. That's going to be negative 1 
and 4, so that's going to be 3. And then negative 1, 2, and 3, 4, that's going to be negative 3 and 8, so that's going to be 5. And what do you notice about the size of this sort of resulting matrix? Well, this is a 3 by 4 matrix because we had 3 rows here, 4 columns here. So these two things there always tell us the size of the resulting matrix. That's the MP in this definition here. So again, you can sort of try to sort of manually use this formula, but I think it's much easier to do matrix multiplication sort of visually. You're taking each row of the first times each column of the second, multiplying those element by element, summing it up, and that gives you one element of the product. Okay, let's try another one. Let's go for A times C. Okay, first question is A times C, is that going to work? Well, A is 3 by 2 and C is 2 by 2. So that is going to be okay. This is going to be 3 by 2 times 2 by 2. What resulting size are we going to expect? Well, these match, so we're okay. So the sort of resulting size up here was that it was going to be 3 by 4. And that's exactly what we saw. So this time, since we're having, we expect a three by two in the result there. So let's see what it's actually going to look like. So we'll take our first row of A and then times our first column of C. So it'll be that five, four times that two, negative one. So that's gonna be a 10 and a negative four. So that's going to be a six. Then five, four times that zero, five, that's gonna be a zero and then a 20. So we get 20. That's going to complete the first row. And now we're going to move on to the second row. So 6, 8 times 2, negative 1. That's going to be a 12 and a negative 8. So that's going to be a 4. And then 6, 8 times 0, 5 is going to be a 0 and a 40. So there we go. And then negative 1, 2. And 2, negative 1. That's going to be a negative 2 and a negative 2. So negative 4. And then negative 1, 2 times 0, 5, that's going to be a 10. So there we go. Notice, as we sort of said, this is going to come out as a 3 by 2, which is exactly what we would have predicted there. Okay. So we did A and B. Let's go ahead and take a look at C. So C, we want to do C, A. So is C, A going to be valid? Notice we just did A, C. Is C, A going to be valid? Well, C, A is going to be 2 by 2. And then we're going to be multiplying that onto A, which is 3 by 2. Notice that this 2 by 2 and this 3 by 2, these do not match up. So this is going to be undefined here. Because, again, the number of columns here does not match the number of rows here, so you're not going to be able to do that multiplication. Now, this tells you something really big right here. This tells us that unlike normal multiplication, scale, you're just multiplying by a number, 5 times 4, well, we know 5 times 4 is commutative. You can do 5 times 4 and get 20, or you can do 4 times 5 and get 20. Matrix multiplication is not commutative, and it might not even be defined in the other direction. Notice, like we just saw here, we got AC, we were able to calculate that, and CA doesn't even make sense. So matrix multiplication, the order in which you do the multiplication, which is on the left and which is on the right, is a big difference. Okay, for D, we want to take a look at CD. Uh, is CD going to make sense? Well, C is 2 by 2, D is 2 by 2, and that means that that is going to work because the number of columns here matches the number of rows there. So let's go ahead and do that computation. So we're going to take the row of C and multiply it by the column of D. So that's going to give us a negative 6 and a 0. So negative 6. Then we're going to take the row of this times the column here. And that's going to give us an 8 and a 0. So we're going to get an 8. Then we're going to take the row here times the column here. So that's going to give us a 3 and a 5, which is an 8. And then we're going to take this row... Uh, there times this column there, that's going to be a negative 4 and a 5. So that sounds like a 1 there. So there we go. Notice also, this time, this and this, right? The number of rows here and the number of columns of the second one, that tells us the resulting size. And that really did give us that 2 by 2 there. Okay. Very nice. Notice also, interestingly, right, uh, CD actually happens to come out as a symmetric matrix, even though uh, C and D individually were not symmetric matrices. 
All right, let's do one last one. Uh, we wanted to go ahead and do DC. So I think, yeah, that was the last one we wanted to do. Yep. Uh, is this one going to make sense? Well, it should. It's two by two, and it's two by two. So this is going to work, and we expect a two by two result here. Now, the interesting question is, is, is it going to be the same as this? Well, we said matrix multiplication in general is not going to be commutative, so we do not expect it to be equivalent to CD. But let's go ahead and take a look. So now we're going to take a row of D times a column of C. So that negative 3, 4 times that 2, negative 1 is going to give us a negative 6 and a negative 4. So that's going to give us a negative 10. Notice right away we can see that because this element does not match this, we're not going to get the same answer there. Again, confirming that matrix multiplication in general is not commutative. Does that mean you can't find matrices out there where like A times B equals B times A? No, there's certainly ones out there. But in general, you cannot make that assumption when doing matrix multiplication. For now, though, let's go ahead and take the first row of D times the second column of C. So that's going to give us a 0 and a 20. So that's going to be 20 there. Uh, then we can move on to the second row of D times the first column here. So that's going to be a 2 and a negative 1. So that's going to be a 1 overall. And then finally, uh, second row of D, second column of C. That's going to be a 0 and a 5, and we get 5 there. So there we go. There are some examples of matrix multiplication. Notice DC and CD, even though they were both defined, not going to be the same matrix showing us matrix multiplication, non-commutative. Once again, just confirming the size component here, number of rows there, number of columns there. That does correspond directly to the size of the result here. So matrix multiplication is in some ways the most interesting operation we're discussing for matrices so far because it acts differently than standard multiplication. Not only does it have sort of a more complicated sort of formula, but it doesn't necessarily have the same properties as standard multiplication. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just tells us that these matrix objects are a bit different than other sort of objects we've studied before. Okay, so since matrix multiplication is a little bit more complex, let's talk about some properties of matrix multiplication. We said it's not commutative, but what is it? Are there other properties that do apply? Well, properties of matrix multiplication. So uh, for all of these statements, we're going to assume that matrix multiplication is well-defined. While it is not commutative, it is associative, meaning that A times B times C is the same as doing A times B first and then multiplying by C. So you can do the multiplications in any order, meaning it is legal to just write a b c you don't need to use parentheses because it doesn't matter what uh which pair you choose to do first it matters which is on left and which is on right but it doesn't matter the order in which you group them to do it is also distributive over matrix addition meaning a times b plus c is the same as a b plus a c and it is distributed the other way. This is sort of interesting that we have to say this, but we do because we know matrix multiplication matters about which side it's on. So if you have A plus B times C, you can put the C onto the A and to the B individually. Notice, again, matrix multiplication is not commutative, so it is important to distinguish between left multiplication and right multiplication by a matrix. Here, we would say that we were left multiplying by A, which is why the A showed up on the left-hand side after distributing. Here, we would say we're right multiplying by C because the C ended up on the right-hand side in each of those multiplications. And since it is non-commutative, it's important to distinguish there. Now, uh, in your textbook, I believe they prove one of these distributive properties. I forget which one. Maybe, I think probably this one here, and they leave this one as an exercise to you. I think it's definitely worth trying to prove this. We will go ahead and prove the first one, that it is associative. This is going to be sort of an interesting proof because, as an example, this is what we call a proof by elements, meaning that we are going to go to the sort of most basic definition, the element definition of matrix multiplication, this messy thing here, and we're going to use that sort of by brute force to show that this a property actually holds. Later on in this video, we'll also see a proof by property, which is a more sort of high level proof. But in this one, because we're trying to prove a basic property, we've got to go very low level and do this as a proof by elements. So what do we need to show? We need to show that A times BC is equal to AB times C. And if we think about what it means to be equivalent as matrices, what that really means we need to show is we need to show that the ij element of A times BC is the same as the ij element of AB 
times C. Because that's what it means for matrices to be equivalent. It means that each component in the matrix is equivalent. Okay, so before we jump into this proof, let's give some sizes. Let's let A be M by N, and B be, say, N by P. Uh, so that'll be good because then this will actually make sure that the multiplication is well defined. And let's let C, uh, C will have to because it multiplies with B at some point, right? Um, since we did B times C here, C will have to be P by, I don't know, let's say P by R. It doesn't matter the letter as long as this and this match and this P and P, those match, right? So we can just go ahead and let these matrices be of these different sizes. So let's go ahead, we need to show this. So let's start from this side and try to work our way over to here. So if we do this, we can say A, B, C, I, J. What can we say about this? Well, we can go ahead and use the definition of matrix multiplication. So this is going to be the sum from K equals one. And since we're doing A, times this BC, we know we're going to be running through its N here. So it's going to be K equals 1 to N of the AIK, and then BC, KJ. So what we're saying there is we're using this definition here, applied though, not to A and B, but to A and this matrix BC, where this is also a product. So notice again, you're running through, you're keeping the ith row here, and you're going and letting the column change. So you're staying in the ith row of A, and you're staying in the jth column of this BC product. Okay, now what we can do is we can unpack this using the definition of matrix multiplication again. So we can say that this is the sum from k equals 1 to n, A, I, K. And then we're going to fill this in with the sum uh, we'll need to use a sort of another uh, index or something. So let's use maybe L. L equals 1. Now, since we're multiplying B and C here, it's going to run through up to P, their shared thing. So from 1 to P of B. And since we want the kjth element, we'll have B, K, L, and C, L, J. So what we're doing there is we're using the definition of matrix multiplication to talk about the kjth element of BC. So it's going to be the sum, as we use another index L in this case, from 1 to P. And of course, we know it's running from 1 to P because that's their shared size component. And then since we want the kjth element, we stay in the kth row of B, and we stay in the jth column of C. Okay, so now this is pretty messy here. But notice that this AIK, the subscripts here, I mean, this K applies to that, but this AIK has nothing relevant with the sort of uh, index in this summation here. So we can bring this inside here. So we can do this as the sum from K equals 1 to N, sum from L equals 1 to P, AIK, BKL, CLJ. Okay, so that's just saying that this AIK, the indices here that apply to that is this. This summation has nothing to do with it. So in terms of this summation, this is just a constant. We can distribute this in. Okay, now what I'd like to do is these are sums, right? So these are sums of this product. You're summing up, you're basically taking the sum of all this stuff, and then the result of that, you're summing all that up. So again, summations, you can change the order of those. You can do them in however order you like. So we'll do this from L equals 1 to P, the sum from K equals 1 to N, A, I, K, B, K, L, C, L, J. So now we're running in that summation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of do this grouping that we did, but in reverse. So I'm going to sort of focus on this component now. And what we're going to notice is that this component here, this is the definition, since we're running from k equals 1 to n, and we're taking the multiplication of a, i, k, b, k, l, this is staying in the ith row of a and the lth column of, of b. So this is the definition of the i lth element of a times b. So this is now the sum from l equals 1 to p of the a 
B matrix and the I L element of that times C L J. So this is saying that this summation here can actually just be thought about as the single element of the product of that A B matrix. And since it's I and L are staying constant, it must be the ith row elth column of that product. But now notice that this is staying always in the ith uh, row of AB and the jth column of C. So this is the definition of the element of the product of AB with C. So this is equal to AB times C at the ijth element. So this is the ijth element of AB times C. So what did we actually show? Well, we showed that the ijth element of A times BC is equivalent to the ijth element of AB times C. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. So we can put our check mark. We can stick a QED on there. Yes, this is a very sort of messy proof because we have to use that sort of messy summation definition. That's why, as we'll see sort of later on, we, we don't generally want to do too many of these by element proofs because by element means you're having to take every element into consideration. But since this is such a basic property that you don't have much else to sort of rely on, but now that we've proven it, right, we now know, well, matrix multiplication is always associative. So we'll see a few more examples of proof by elements, but in general, once we've established these basic properties, we'll more be interested in proving things using these properties. But wanted you guys to at least see one example of proof by elements. If you're a little unsure about this just because of all the subscripts and indices, go ahead and read through your textbook for when they prove one of these distributive ones, and then try the other distributive property on your own. Okay. For now, though, let's move on and talk about some special matrices that relate to matrix multiplication. So first, a little bit of power notation for matrix multiplication. Um, you guys know how to use exponents for normal arithmetic, like 3 squared we know is just 3 times 3, or 5 cubed is 5 times 5 times 5. You can do the same thing for matrices. Um, because of the size constraints of matrix multiplication, we do need to let A be a square matrix. That's the only type of matrix that we can guarantee will always multiply with itself. If you did M by N, then it wouldn't be able to multiply it with itself. So um, if we let N be a positive whole number, then we can define a matrix to a power as just itself multiplied with itself N times, just as you normally would for a power notation. Perhaps a little bit more interesting, though, is a very special matrix. This, um, maybe I should have like bolded it or something like that. This is a very important matrix. We're going to talk about this matrix quite a bit. Um, this is what is called the identity matrix. So the identity matrix is always a square matrix. The identity matrix of size n by n uh, is a square matrix written as i sub n with the elements defined as follows. The ijth element of i sub n is equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. So if you're in any position where the row position does not match the column position, the element is equal to 0. And i sub n at i j equals 1 if you are at a position where the row and column are equivalent. In other words, if we were to say this in English rather than trying to write it out in a mathematical notation, the identity matrix has zeros everywhere except on its diagonal where it has all 1s. So, for example, i sub 3 would be the 3 by 3 identity matrix where you'd have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So that's the three by three identity matrix. Why is the identity matrix so important? Well, we'll see that it has tons of applications as we go further, but at its sort of base level, it acts for matrix multiplication as a one. So if you have M be an, if you have A be an M by N matrix, then A times I sub N, notice that that's gonna make sense because you're gonna have M by N times N by N, so it will make sense because these guys match. Well, if you do A times the identity matrix, you get A. And if you do IM times A, notice you have to use a different size because now it'd be M by N times M by N. And that'll make sense because these guys match. Well, IM times A is equal to A. So in other words, for matrix multiplication, when you want to multiply matrices, the identity matrix acts like a one. Multiplying by it doesn't change anything. So this identity matrix will show up a lot as we move further, but got to remember it has these main properties. Not a bad idea to try to use the element definition of matrix multiplication as well as the element definition of the identity matrix to try to prove these properties on your own. I believe your textbook might prove one of them, but you might want to try proving one or both of them on your own. All right.
Now, we'd like to sort of combine, uh, as sort of our, our last major part of our discussion here, some of the operations that we've now been discussing, matrix addition, matrix multiplication, all this stuff, with that one operation that we said was sort of interesting because it's exclusive to matrices, which was the transpose. So I'd like to look at a couple properties uh, of the transpose and how it relates to these matrix operations. So first property that we'd like to talk a little bit is uh, that the transpose of the transpose gets you back to where you started. That should make sense. If the transpose interchanges rows and columns and you do it twice, you should be back to where you started. So the transpose of the transpose is back to the original matrix. The second property is that the transpose distributes over addition. So if you have A plus B transpose, that's the same as doing A transpose plus B transpose. And the transpose distributes over matrix multiplication, but it changes the order of the multiplication. So AB parentheses transpose is equivalent to B transpose times A transpose. We're going to go ahead and prove property one. Once again, for these, I would try to prove these on your own using the element definition. So as we go to prove property one here, we are going to do this as a proof by elements. So again, this is going to be a proof by elements. So what do we need to show? Well, uh, we, we need to show is that the ij element and notice that sometimes I like to use these brackets just so we can sort of have nicer parentheses and everything. The ijth element of A transpose transpose needs to be equivalent to the ijth element of the original matrix. So this should be pretty simple. What we need to do is we need to start from this side and work our way over to here. So let's go ahead and say what we can say about this side. So what can we say about the ijth element of A transpose transpose? Well, what does this transpose do? It changes the row and column position. So this must be equivalent to the jth element of a transpose, because that's how you figure out the transpose. You, you interchange the row and column. So if you want the ijth element of the transpose of a transpose, you should use the jth element of a transpose. But what is that? Well, that must be the ijth element of the original matrix, because again, to deal with that transpose, you just simply interchange the row and column. And notice that's exactly what we needed to show. So nice and easy, here we go. Again, this one much simpler than the first proof that we did with the associative property. But again, this is a proof by elements because we did it from the sort of ground level. We went down to the element definition, in this terms, in this case, the element definition of transpose, which is I, the ijth element of the transpose is the jth element of the original matrix and we proved it directly. All right, before we finish up this video, what I'd like to do real quick is since we've done several proofs by elements, I'd like to do a couple proofs by property, meaning that now that we've established some properties of matrix uh, multiplication of the transpose, let's prove some additional properties making use of these properties rather than always having to go back to the raw elements. So we're gonna to try to prove two statements using properties. Uh, we're gonna prove that that transpose property here that we just stated here, it applies to more than two matrices. So we're gonna apply, we're gonna prove that A, B, C transpose is C transpose, B transpose, A transpose. And we're gonna prove that if A and B are both symmetric N by N matrices, then A plus B is a symmetric matrix. Now, for these, you could try to go through and do manual proofs by elements, and it'll will, it will work. It has to. That foundational level should always sort of work. But we can do these more sort of elegantly using the properties we've already established. So for A, we need to show that A, B, C transpose is C transpose, B transpose, A transpose. So let's start from the left-hand side and work our way over. So A, B, C transpose. Well, why don't we do a little grouping? We can sort of group and we can say, let's put some parentheses around AB. So now we're treating AB as a single matrix and C. Now we just proved over here that the transpose distributes over AB as long as you change the order. So we can go ahead and distribute it now that we have a product of just two matrices. So we can say that this is C transpose and then AB transpose. And now we can apply the transpose again to this product, because again, this product is just a product of two matrices. So that's C transpose, B transpose, A transpose. Check. So we did it. Nice and easy. 
When you prove things using properties, you're proving at a higher level. So the proof should be very simple, maybe a couple lines at most. All right, for B, we need to think a little bit about what we need to show. So we have A, B are both symmetric, then A plus B is symmetric. So let's think about first what we know, A and B are both symmetric. So A, B, symmetric. What does that tell us? That implies that A transpose is equal to A, B transpose is equal to B. That's what it means to be a symmetric matrix. What we need to show is that A plus B is a symmetric matrix. So we need to show A plus B symmetric. That's what we'd say in words, which means we really need to show that A plus B transpose is equal to A plus B. That's what it means to be symmetric. We need to show that when we apply the transpose to the sum, we get back the original thing. So let's try to prove this. So A plus B transpose. Well, we just showed over here that one of the properties is that transpose distributes over addition without changing anything. So as long as you apply it to each piece. So that's A transpose plus B transpose. And then by assumption, we know that A transpose is equal to A and B transpose is equal to B. So we can say A plus B. And we might want to make a note since that's not a standard thing. This is by assumption. So uh, let's just make a note here. This is by assumption. And this one here is also by assumption. And what do you know? We've shown that A plus B transpose is equal to A plus B. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. So again, very quick and easy because you're doing it at a high level based on properties that you've already previously proven or that have been established for you. So whenever you're proving by properties, it's going to be a lot faster, but you have to do it based off of things that have already been established. Okay, let's wrap this uh, sort of discussion up of ma matrix operations by talking a little bit about how these sort of things result uh, or sort of the results that apply when we talk about some of those special matrices, namely upper triangular, lower triangular, and diagonal. So here are some results about sort of matrix multiplication for upper triangular, lower triangular, and diagonal matrices. So we're going to suppose both A and B are both n by n matrices that are both upper triangular, or they're both lower triangular, or they're both diagonal. So all these results apply as long as both of them are the same type. So either both upper triangular, both lower, or both diagonal. Then the sum will be upper triangular, or if both are lower triangular, the sum will be lower triangular, or if both are diagonal, then both the sum will be diagonal. Scalar multiplication will keep the same type. So if A is upper triangular, KA will be upper triangular. If A is lower triangular, KA will be lower triangular. And if A is diagonal, KA will be diagonal. And the product will also maintain that property. So if both A and B are upper triangular, the product will be upper triangular. If both A and B are lower triangular, then the product will be lower triangular. And if both A and B are diagonal, then the product will be diagonal. So there's a Technically, I mean, I wrote this out as three statements. I guess technically you could argue there's nine statements here because there's this statement for upper triangular, this statement for lower triangular, this statement for diagonal, so on and so forth. Um, your textbook uh, goes through and proves uh, this result here, I believe, for uh, upper triangular and lower triangular. We'll go ahead and prove it for diagonal just to do something a little bit different. And again, you might want to try these other ones on your own to see if you can prove these. Now, Notice that, again, this is sort of our first set of results here. So once again, we're not going to be able to prove this via properties because we don't really have any properties to go back to. We're going to have to do this by element. So this will be another proof by element. So we're going to go ahead and let's assume AB n by n diagonal. So what does that mean? That means this means... A i j equals to zero, i not equal to j, b i j equal to zero when i is not equal to j. That's what it means to be a diagonal matrix. It means you're always equal to zero whenever you're not on that diagonal. What we need to show is we need to show that a b is diagonal. So we need to show that a b i j equals to zero if i not equal to j. So that's what we need to show. We need to show that the product is always equal to zero if you're not on the diagonal. We don't care about what happens on the diagonal. On the diagonal itself, we could have zero values. We could have non-zero values. It doesn't matter. 
We just need to make sure that everything off the diagonal is zero. So let's go ahead and actually try to do this. So our proof here. So let's go ahead and say what we can about A, B, I, J, because that's what we're trying to show. So by the definition of matrix multiplication, that's the sum from K equals one to N of A, I, K, B, K, J. Okay. Now, that's, that's our definition in general. Let's go ahead and assume I not equal to J because that's what we're interested in. And what we need to show is we, we need to show that this is going to be equal to zero if I is not equal to J. Okay, so if I is not equal to J, let's think about this A, I, K. Well, this is always going to be zero whenever K is not equal to I. So we should make a note here. A, I, K equal to zero when I not equal to K. So this is always gonna be zero whenever I is not equal to K. So the only moment that's going to sort of matter is when K does equal I. Because if K does equal I, then this part will be non-zero. So what we can then say is A, B, I, J. Well, we don't need to do this whole sum from K equals one to N because we know that whenever uh, this, whenever this is zero, this product is gonna be zero. So this is going to reduce to just A, I, I, B, I, J. Because again, the only one of this that is possibly non-zero is when that K is equal uh, to I. Otherwise, this is guaranteed to be zero. But what do we know about this? Well, remember, we assume that I is not equal to J. So this B, I, J, well, that's gonna be zero too. So, but B, I, J is equal to zero since I not equal to J. So that tells us that A, B, I, J is going to be equal to zero when I not equal to J. So A, B is diagonal. So there's a quick sort of by element proof that if you have two diagonal matrices and you multiply them, the result will be diagonal. That's also true for two upper triangulars, two lower triangulars. It's also true for if you sum two diagonals, two upper triangulars, two lower triangulars, or if you scalar and multiply an upper triangular, lower triangular, or diagonal. If you want on your own, you can prove some of these other statements in a very similar fashion to what we just did here. All right, last thing we're gonna say in this, we've pretty much said a ton about all these different operations, is we should say a little bit, since we did talk about matrix functions, about how the calculus of matrix functions works, since we might wanna do operations. So this is just gonna be a quick discussion on that. Scalar multiplication can be extended to multiplication by a scalar function, and derivatives and integrals, as you would expect, are performed element by element. So to make sure we understand what that means, let's define a quick ma uh, matrix function. So A of X is equal to this two by two matrix function, E to the X, X squared cosine X three. So let's determine each of the following real quick. So for A, X squared A of X, which is what we would mean by multiplying by a scalar function, this X squared out here is not a matrix function, it's just an X squared, so it's a scalar function. We just distribute that just like we would distribute scalar multiplication. So it'd become x squared e to the x, x to the fourth, x squared cosine x, and 3x squared. So you can always scalar multiply a matrix function by a function, and you just do that onto each element. For the derivative, a prime of x, well, we just differentiate element by element. So we get e to the x, 2x, negative sine x, and zero. So if you ever need to differentiate a matrix function, you just differentiate each element. And integration, same thing. So if we have the definite integral, zero to two, ax dx. This would become the matrix, integral zero to two, e to the x dx, integral zero to two, x squared dx, integral zero to two, cosine x dx, integral zero to two, three dx which we could then integrate each one and get like e to the x evaluated from zero to two, uh, one third x cubed evaluated from zero to two, sine x evaluated from zero to two, and three x evaluated from zero to two. And then if we put all that in, I guess we get e squared minus one, uh, eight thirds sine of two, and six. 
and that would be our result. Notice that the definite integral doesn't yield a number here. It actually yields a two by two matrix, but now a matrix of values, not a matrix of functions because we did a definite integral. Technically, if we did the indefinite integral, we'd get four different sort of component functions uh, plus constants on each of them. So this here sort of wraps up uh, your sort of matrix operations. So now you know how to add, subtract, scalar multiply, matrix multiply. You also know how this sort of relates to some of these special matrix functions, such as like the transpose of a matrix. Um, and you know how to perform some basic calculus on matrix functions. Again, we're not going to be doing too much with matrix functions, but it's still a good idea to just have a basic sense of that. Because when we return to differential equations, we will see a little bit of this. For now, though, this wraps up section 2.2. Uh, so in our next video, we'll be moving into section 2.3 and starting to see how matrices relate to solution sets of systems of equations.